First of all, let me introduce myself. I'm Katie Wolfenden. I'm the Deputy University Librarian at the University of Manchester, and I'm going to be uh, co-chairing uh, today with my colleague David Wright from Southampton. David, do you want to just quickly say hello? Hello, everyone. Nice to see you all. Um, my name is David Wright. I'm the Associate Director of uh, for User Experience at the University of Southampton Libraries. OK, thanks, David. So our jobs as chair uh, today, just to keep the programme uh, running uh, smoothly for you all, and I'm going to take the first half of the session and then David's going to pick up uh, after we've had our presentations and chaired the discussion half of the session. So for now, my first job is to just give you a little bit of background and context to start us all off. So first of all, just to uh, reiterate something that I think probably already been mentioned in the chat, but the aim of the RL UK space programme is to develop a forum where RLUK members can engage in open dialogue and share their knowledge and experience around spatial redesign and capital builds. Um, as part of the RLUK strategy, the programme aims to hold three events annually and develop resources on themes of interest to RLUK members. This event is actually the, um, the third uh, event and the last event of the, uh, of the 2022 uh, um, series, but recordings from previous events can be viewed on the RL UK website if you want to catch up and have missed any. So today's event um, is going to involve three presentations that will showcase how research libraries are designing and reinventing their buildings and spaces with the aim of becoming more inclusive places where people from various backgrounds can enjoy their work and explore and learn together. Okay, so without further ado, uh, I'll start by uh, introducing our first presentation. So the first presentation we have today um, is from Kirsty Lingstart and David Brown um, from the University of York. Um, Kirsty is the Director of uh, Library Archives and Learning Services at the University of York, and David Brown is the Academic Liaison Librarian at the University of York. Um, Kirsty leads on the development of services across a range of different areas with a focus on ensuring that these respond to user needs across the board. David um, co-managed the uh, LibInspo competition, which first inspired uh, the topic of conversation uh, today, which is the family study room uh, that's been developed at the University of York. And that's going to be the, the feature of our presentation. So. Without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Kirsty, and you can uh, get going. Thanks very much, Katie. Yes, so developing a family study room. So if we kick off um, with the first slide, um, this is really a room that's designed um, for students with children um, and they can study in there while supervising their children. So it's just to be really clear, um, it is supervised um, at all times by the parents or the guardians and carers um, that are coming to use the room. Um, and I just thought I'd give a little bit of background around about the university strategy and why this is such an important development for us. Um, so if I can go on to the next slide, please. Um, so our 2030 strategy um, very much positions us as a university for public good. Um, and that means that we're very much looking to encourage more students from diverse backgrounds, which we're anticipating will really change the student population that will be at York in the future. And therefore initiatives such as the Family Study Room really enable us to respond and cater for that as well. Next slide, please. So, Within the strategy, there are particular areas that really give us a focus around about it. And within the university strategy, we're looking very much at provide education that empowers. Um, but within library archives and learning services, um, the piece that we're supporting is delivering engaging collaborative and learning experiences. Um, and again, it's around about empowering all our learners, but also very much about putting our learners be they undergrad, postgrad, and again, by learners, we quite often think also about the sort of staff um, and the wider public, because we're all learning all the time, um, putting them at the heart of all those sort of services that we're providing. Next slide, please. And again, this idea of creating a community without limits, um, a really sort of diverse community, 
The University of York, from its very inception, had internationalism um, at the very heart of its ethos when it was set up in the 1960s. Um, and again, that's something that we continue to have at the heart of it, along with that sort of sense of belonging, creating a sense of community at the university. And so again, I've just sort of highlighted what we in Library Archives and Learning Services are very much focusing on and feel we can deliver to this is that inclusive, but also inspirational environment that we create um, through the facilities that we run um, and enable people to connect, but also enable them to take on board that learning. So these are all underpinning factors which make things like the family study room um, a really important development um, and mean that we're going to look at a range of different audiences over the next few years and develop more specialised spaces to support them. But if we can go to the next slide, I'm sure you're all eager to see what the family study room looks like. Um, so here you go. And at this point, I'm going to hand over to David, who really led through and took the development to its completion. Thanks. Thank you very much, Kirsty. So Kirsty's asked me to pick up here with the wonderful job of showing you some photos of the family study room. But the trade-off for that nice job is I also get to tell you about some of the challenges that we went through as well. So I'll do my best to give a rosy picture, but also some of the uh, the realities of how we got to this point as well. So this is a view of the family study room as you enter the space, which gives a nice kind of contrast of the two halves of, of the room, really. You can see over towards the back there, that's the boring bit. That's the, the study part of the room that we have. Uh, we have four desks set up there, two with PCs, two just study desks. Um, so those are where the students will work. Um, and you can see we've set up the room so that those spaces overlook the lovely play area here. Um, and this is a space that we've designed with mixed age range in mind. Um, so it's really for any child. Um, the university doesn't have a set definition of that, but we determined that to be anyone from a newborn right through to primary school um, age. So probably under 12 was our, our target audience for this. Uh, because of that mixed age range, we had to be mindful of what we purchased in terms of toys and other games and equipment in the room. Uh, we used a specialist uh, supplier to nurseries for all the furniture in the space, which looks really, really nice. Um, and we've got a mixture of things, books and toys, all of which um, we tested with a choke tester to make sure that there, there were no small parts. Um, so I'll just run you through a few photos of the space to give you a real sense of, of what it looks like. And it's really nice to be at this point where I can now uh, show you some of the, the interesting things that we were able to do. So this is an alternative view of the play space to give you a better sense of how that all works together. Um, so we've got a couple of different um, size tables and chairs for the different um, mix of, of kids in there. We've got a kind of comfy seating area in the corner there, which is sort of, sort of reading nook um, and various bits of furniture for all the storage of the, the toys and games that, that we purchased. We were deliberately cautious in what we purchased for the space. I'll talk a little bit more about why later on, but um, as you can imagine, there are lots of considerations for a space like this. Um, we didn't want to purchase a lot of things that we would then have to take away later if they didn't prove to be workable. But we also wanted to leave room for students to suggest things to us. So we have a, a reasonably minimal starting point, but which we could add on later through user feedback as well. Uh, so to give another view, this is the reading nook. I know I want one of those uh, toadstools at home as well, but uh, alas, it doesn't quite go uh, with, with the rest of my, my home decor, but you never know, you can make it work. Uh, but it gives a sense of, of the space there, which is great. Uh, this shot is uh, shamelessly uh, set up. It's my wife and our two-year-old son um, who we volunteered to come and test the room for us. And he had a lovely time. Um, so that was the first kind of seal of approval that we had for the space really, which was great to see it being used. Um, actually since then when we've run inductions with the students some of them have brought their kids along which has been great um, and the kids haven't wanted to leave so that that to me says everything you need to about how that space works really it's 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 beloved by the children which is kind of what we were were going for and another shot here which really is the kind of ethos of the room um a child playing happily while their their parent is able to get some some work done in the background there so that kind of gives a nice sense of what we were aiming to achieve really um with this space so I'll say a little bit more about why we introduced the room. Kirsty's given an introduction to the university strategy, which really gave us the background and the context where we knew that this was something that could be um, achieved within the university. The, the first kind of uh, impetus, the catalyst for this came from our Libinspo competition, which is an innovation competition that we've run twice previously. We are running it again this academic year. Um, and essentially that invites students to submit their great ideas for the library. We have a competitive process, which results in around six students coming to pitch their idea. 
um, and the winner is is kind of crowned the, the library innovator uh, of that year. And then we commit at least to exploring that idea, if not making it a reality, if we can do. So the family study room was the winning idea of the 2020 competition. Um, sadly, of course, the world changed quite dramatically very soon after that competition culminated. Um, so we weren't able to act on the idea as quickly as we would have liked to. But we had the opportunity to revisit that ahead of this academic year. So that was great to be able to go back to that, that piece of work. Um, and actually, when we started our work in earnest, looking at the feasibility of the space, it really shone a light on the pressures, the challenges faced by this, this group of students. Students with children is the term that we use at the University of York. You may otherwise know them as student parents, uh, another term used for that group. And the, the research that we did, of course, you know, we're librarians, we did a literature review on this, um, really highlighted a lot of the, the time pressures that these students have, but also the sense of a, a fractured identity that they have to almost carve out different parts of their, their study time and their lives. Um, in order to be mum or dad one moment, then a student, then maybe an employee if they've got a, a job somewhere else as well. The, the introduction of a, a family study room allows them a chance not to have to carve out the identity in quite the same way, that they can be both a student and a parent at the same time. They don't have to um, make a choice essentially about what they'll do. Um, and it gives them a sense of belonging to the university. It, it makes our services available to this group in a way that maybe they weren't before. We've never actively excluded children from the library. We don't have a policy that says they're not welcome. Um, but that's quite a far and away difference from very visibly showing that they are welcome. And, and that's what something like the, the Family Study Room allowed us to do. When we started this project, we worked with students with children um, and colleagues in, in our student hub to get their feedback. I wanted to share with you a couple of the quotes that the students gave us um, early on in that process. And so I will read them because I think that they give us a really nice sense of why we did this. So this was one quote from a student. I got so excited and looking forward to using the room with my son. Whenever we pass by the library, he points to the library and says, look, your school is there, mum. Sometimes I left him home and went to study and I needed to explain where I'm going. And I don't want to give a negative impression on him about studying that reminds him it's something causing separating his mum from him. The family study room can help me to introduce him to the library as a nice place where we can spend time together as well. It will definitely support my well-being. A couple of other short quotes. It would allow me to study in the library, which I currently can't do. Um, so even though we, we wouldn't have discouraged that student to come at all, this space enables them to do it in, in a different way. And finally, that it would make me much more likely for me to be able to finish my course, um, which is a really fundamental difficulty for these students. They do find it more difficult to find time to study. Retention is a problem for, for this group. Um, and those early um, quotes really gave us the kind of impetus to carry on. Um, I'll, I'll talk in a moment about some of the challenges that we faced in this project. It's not always been straightforward, but actually having that as our backdrop helped us to push through some of those challenges because we knew that it was going to be really valuable for, for the students who used that, that space. We did try to involve users in our planning wherever possible. Um, you can imagine that there was a very broad group of stakeholders um, with an interest um, in this project. Um, so we tried to involve them all as much as possible to shape our approach and, and how we worked the project. Um, that, of course, included students with children, um, our own staff um, who had obviously interest in how we would develop the, the policies, the procedures around the space. Um, and we worked with a lot of different departments within the university. There was the student hub uh, within the student services team. Um, they have a dedicated member of staff who works with students with, students with children. We also worked, of course, with security and with the health and safety departments across the university. So a huge range of, of people. I don't think I've ever worked on a project with such a large list of, of stakeholders to, to consider. At the start of the process, we asked students with children to complete a short survey for us. So that was trying to understand about their needs, what they might want from a space like this. And then we also invited students to join our user advisory group. So that was a, a group of interested students and others who would be able to provide us with more detailed feedback about our proposals. And um, so, for example, they helped us when we were um, initially writing the terms and conditions for using the space, but also um, with testing our induction process as well. So that was really invaluable. 
just to make sure that we were pitching things in the right way to that audience. I've mentioned a couple of them already. One of the challenges of this space is rules, rules, and more rules. Um, there really is no getting around it. We had to have a lot of rules in place for using the family study room. As you can imagine, that was a real key part of our safeguarding procedures for the space. Um, so to name just a few of those, those rules, students have to initially register for the room. So we have a Google form that they complete to tell us that they are a student with children. We don't ask for proof beyond that. We take it as read really that they would only want to use that space when they have a child. Um, so they would get in touch with us um, through that Google form. We contact them to arrange an induction session. That's a mandatory part of the process where we invite them to attend roughly a 30 minute induction. Uh, we show them the space. We talk them through the important health and safety considerations, uh, expectations around behavior in the space, all those kind of different things. And it's an opportunity for them to ask us questions, of course, as well. If they're happy to, they're, they're wanting to proceed, we ask them to sign a copy of our terms and conditions. Um, you can see the terms and conditions on the Family Study Room webpage if you would like to do that. They're, they're fully available there um, for anyone to see. Um, students are expected to book a seat at the moment before they come or, or when they arrive, they can book a seat at that point as well. Um, and we ask them to sign in and out as well, which is another important aspect of our safeguarding process. So we know who actually is there and we have a way to contact them in an emergency if we need to. Now, all of that is as you would expect in many ways. We need to have these rules in place in order to um, ensure that the room is safe and secure for the, the students and their children who are using it. But of course, that is slightly at odds with the needs of this group. They're a time poor group, as was evidenced in our literature review. So it's it's a challenge in some ways where we're asking a group who already have to jump through lots of other hoops in their lives to go through more of those. Um, so it, it's a, a tension in some ways between those two things. I would say so far users do seem happy that, that the rules are there for a purpose. Uh, one of the challenges we have seen is, is pushing back on those rules. You're asking, well, you've allowed this, can we allow something similar as well? So for example, at the moment, we don't allow partners in the room, so the student can come with their child, but at the moment we don't allow um, guests or, or external um, people outside the university to use the space. Um, that's at least during our review period. Um, so it's been helpful for us to have a review period built into the process because it allows us that checking point to really revisit those, those policies. So we're monitoring the policies, we're monitoring the feedback from our, our users in particular, and we will, as part of our, our review closure, be looking to reduce whatever bureaucracy red tape we can do to make the process as, as streamlined as possible for our users. You will not be surprised at my next slide. I'm sure many of you who have tried to do such a space will have um, come across similar issues. We had a complex group of stakeholders on this project, and that inevitably meant some quite challenging conversations um, along the way in that process. It will be no surprise to anyone to hear that one of those challenging conversations was with our colleagues in our health and safety department at the university. Uh, when we look back on those conversations, they're, they're probably inevitable. Quite understandably, they were raising issues around the potential risks involved in the room, um, lots of red flags around the processes that we needed. And that ultimately was why we had things like the review period, uh, booking and signing in and out were all processes that that essentially were, were a byproduct of the conversations we had with, with health and safety. I think one of the challenges that we faced and on reflection and what we might, might have done differently was the point at which we involved our health and safety colleagues in the conversation. We undertook quite a lot of feasibility work before we invited them to take part in the project. Um, I think they felt that maybe the horse had bolted. We'd done too much work before we involved them. But from our point of view, of course, we wanted to ensure that this was something we could actually do before we started talking to other colleagues in the university. So there's perhaps a, a difficulty there around expectations. They, they I think, um, would have perhaps expected to be involved at the earlier stage of the process, but we wanted to have got to a certain point before we did that. I think ultimately it helped us that we had the backing of senior colleagues within the university. And as Kirsty's outlined, we also had the university strategy behind us as well. If you want to see a little bit more of the feasibility work that we did, I've linked here the brochure that we created. And we shared that with lots of our different stakeholders, and that includes links to the literature review that we conducted as well.
as well as the family study room, um, we realised quite early on that that wasn't going to work for everybody. In fact, students told us as much in the feedback that we we received from our students for children. Many of them absolutely loved the idea, but others, it just wasn't right for them. You know, their child would not work well in that situation or, or neither would they. So as well as the room, we decided to introduce a range of measure, measures to help this group. Um, so that includes a book retrieval service where we'll, we'll um, get books from the open shelves for them. We don't have that, that service. Otherwise, they have longer return periods, longer loads on laptops. Um, so all of those adjusted services hopefully allow that group of users to engage with the library in a way that they haven't been able to previously, even where they're not able to use the, the room that we have created um, for them from there. So I'll briefly just mention the impact and, and where I'm running low on time. So we are roughly halfway through our six month pilot. We've conducted um, inductions for 23 students so far. So modest usage on the room, but we do expect that to grow fairly gradually, particularly with word of mouth over time. We haven't really got much formal feedback from students yet. We will be doing that as part of the closure for the review period. Um, but anecdotally, students are very happy with the space. They speak very highly of feeling valued by the institution, of being noticed, of being able to use the, the library more effectively uh, than they were previously. And that's really encouraging for us because that's really why we, we did this, this project in the first place and why it's been worth working through some of the, the challenges that we've seen. So I'll close my presentation there. I'll be happy to take questions later in the Q&A. Thank you very much for listening. Many thanks, David and Kirsty. That was an absolutely fascinating uh, presentation and, uh, and one that I know is prompting quite a lot of questions uh, that we'll uh, no doubt come back to later. Um, but for now, we'll, we'll move on to our, our second um, presentation. Um, so um, the next presentation, Presentation is from Phil Cheeseman, who's the Associate Director for Academic Services in the Library at Lancaster University. Um, Phil's areas of responsibility include teaching, engagement, library special collections and archives. And he took a, a leading role in the planning and development of the library extension and in the development of the library vision. And he's going to talk to us today uh, about the work that's taking place at Lancaster uh, in relation to their new extension, which was uh, launched in uh, April 2021, and how that's intersected with the um, equality, diversity and inclusion elements of the library strategy. Um, so over to you, Phil. Thanks very much. Um, so I just shake you hear me okay? Yeah, good. Um, just share my screen. Can you confirm for me that you can see that okay? Yeah, we can see that, Phil, thank you. Brilliant. Uh, okay, um, so um, thank you very much. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna talk to you about uh, our library, the most recent extension um, uh, that we opened in 2021, but really just focusing on, on how that's enabled us to realize some of uh, the work we've been doing in, in our vision around EDI. Um, so, um, just moving um, on. Okay, yeah, so, so as I say, what I'd like to do is to say, share a little bit about our vision for the library space, um, first of all, uh, and, and, then, and then to show you how that space has, has helped us to realise some of those aspects of uh, our vision around EDI. Um, so the space itself, um, you're looking at part of the extension here. Um, uh, you can see that it's an open study area. Um, uh, notable features are the, um, uh, the very large lampshades, which are as big as they look here, um, uh, and also the living wall in the background. Uh, but behind it, you can see the, the, dark, uh, the, the dark curtains, uh, which uh, lead into some new spaces that are more flexible, um, and I'm going to share some of how we've been using those spaces. Um, and very much our vision for the space was that it should um, promote the work we do around partnership and collaboration. So the work we, uh, we did in, in preparation for the extension took place almost five years ago now with um, some UX work to look at how the building was being used, uh, what our students wanted from it uh, and other library users, um, how they preferred to work. And it was clear that certainly we needed more space and we needed a higher, um, a high quality space that 
met a variety of different needs, but also that we needed some different kinds of spaces. So um, we um, need space where we could have dedicated support for students that, that didn't exist in the library at that time, but also um, space to connect with our research communities and um, to support ambitions for um, reaching out to the wider community. So the extension opened in 2021. Um, it provided us with a range of new spaces uh, in addition to around 450 addi additional study spaces, uh, predominantly on the ground floor, there are a series of rooms that include the digital studio, which is a bit of a workshop area, um, two research labs that are focused for collaborative work. And you're looking at, at, uh, at one of them here. Um, uh, you can see that they are fairly flexible spaces and adjacent to them is a exhibition and event space that um, again is, is very flexible and you can just see this at the side here uh, a partition wall that can be open and closed to allow us to reconfigure the space and that's really important in terms of you know this being a prime location within the library and needing to be flexible in but also to have a clear identity um, on on b floor we have a, an area called supported learning which is the focus for our faculty librarian and learning development teams um, uh, and work they do in the library uh, when we're not out here working in the faculties. Um, but we've also reviewed some of the other areas that, of the library and how we use those uh, and, and be more creative in the ways in which we're using them. So, so moving on to think about the library's role in EDI, um, uh, as we were developing our library vision, we, we had a lot of conversations with students and staff right across the university. Um, as well as amongst our own library teams to, to try and pull out what was the role for the library. Uh, and we were really challenged by some of the comments that came back that really saw us as, as leaders in this area uh, and identified the opportunities and, and, and challenged us to make sure that we um, saw this as a core part of what we do. So our library vision, uh, <laughs> At its heart, it's pretty clear. Well, first of all, it says we'll place the library at the heart of all we do. Um, uh, we'll, uh, we'll place the heart at the, at the heart of the university's community. Um, uh, and then it has this um, these three words, we, we'll connect, we'll innovate, and we'll include. Uh, and they really underpin all we do, and we keep returning to them again and again. And you'll see that they're represented in five themes that are illustrated at the bottom of the slide here. And, and central to those five themes is equality, diversity, and inclusivity. And, and it's that that I'll focus on now. And what I'm gonna do is to share some of um, how the building space has enabled that kind of activity. So our equality, diversity, and inclusivity theme uh, uh, includes a commitment that we'll, um, represent all the diverse communities that make up our university, that will provide an inclusive and supportive and safe environment where everyone belongs, but also where they can all contribute to our distinctiveness. Um, it, for us, we, it's a richer, um, more lively, more um, uh, inclusive and, and effective space where, when it has a wider range of contributions. So um, we think we've got a lovely library. People tell us it's lovely, um, but sometimes there's a, a subtext there, uh, uh, you know, is it a library that's for me? Um, and that may be because they perceive barriers, they, you know, it's, it, it can be an intimidating space for the new students, um, uh, as well as for members of the public. Um, they see a lot of uh, library users studying, um, uh, and uh, very engaged in their work and wonder what the library has to offer them. And, and certainly our professional services staff have, have also said, it's a great academic space, but we're not quite sure it's for us. So those are some of the things we've been trying to challenge over the last year to 18 months uh, as we explore um, what EDI means for us as a library service and how the library building can contribute to uh, um, breaking down some of those barriers, 
helping people to feel that the library represents them, um, but also um, using it for new opportunities to, to engage. Um, and I'm going to show you some examples, um, a real smattering of, of things that we've uh, done over the past year and a half and how they've helped to inform the ways we're thinking about EDI. So um, in common with many of you, um, for, for a long time now, we've, um, uh, we've celebrated diversity through a variety of um, events. Uh, and, and we started very much, I guess, within our comfort zone by having book displays and, uh, and library guides um, uh, and uh, other ways of showcasing our collections. Uh, to uh, coincide with uh, Black History Month or LGBT uh, Plus Month, um, uh, other uh, um, uh, annual events like that. And we, we very much continue to do the, that, and it is very much uh, welcomed by our library users. So um, uh, that, that, I guess, um, hasn't been impacted by the space so much. We, we've always been able to do that, but it has become more prominent in terms of very being very visible at the entrance to the library and, and we've had numerous comments from people saying the library seems much more the kind of place that represents me because of um the the, the very um uh, open and um visible ways in which we acknowledge the diversity of our, our community of users but we've we've started to explore other ways in which we can be um more active in this area. So that began with things like reading groups when we were uh, mostly online, uh, progressed to author events and film screenings and, and panel discussions in the library. And some of the spaces we have now enable us to do that while study can continue on for other library users. So um, the, the events that we ran very much as one-off or ad hoc events, have gradually developed into a program of activity so that we now have a coordinated program of events uh, that recognize and celebrate diversity. And all of those events now um, are very much um, run in partnership with others. So that might be running, uh, working in partnership with student groups, uh, with local community groups, or all, all with others, uh, with academic staff as well, um, to ensure that uh, we use every opportunity to bring people together and to learn from one another. And it has presented us with um, some nice challenges to have and that we get a lot of interest in using library space. Uh, and so for this um, year, we've started to introduce an event proposal form that enables us to um, get a good sense of what people's expectations are for using the space and um, uh, for us to get an idea of whether it aligns with the, the kinds of activities that we, we feel the library um, has a role in promoting. Um, so so that's, that's been a useful way of practically managing expectations for the space and, and helping to promote this kind of activity. Um, a more recent example, just to give you an illustration of how um, things have moved on for us over the past year or so, um, so um, when we celebrated Pride, in, uh, Pride Month in 2021, as I said, we had book displays and um, uh, online resources and a range of things, and, and those continued. In this past year, it was an opportunity to work with uh, not only university LGBTQ plus groups, but also those in the city as well, um, and to bring them uh, together with, with our university community. Uh, and have a much richer programme of activity. And you can just see here the, the wall of appreciation, uh, which I don't know how many post-it notes are there, but uh, a, a fair number. Um, uh, and uh, uh, one of the events that we held in, in our event space, which was a storytelling uh, event for, for, um, uh, for children uh, uh, of university members. So um, uh, events throughout the year have coalesced around two, two key periods for us, and, and that those were our library festivals. Um, so the first of these was, was part of our opening of this space. And, and both of them have focused very much on building um, communities, on well-being, but, but, but this year in particular on equality, diversity and inclusion. It's a theme that 
um, uh, does bring people together uh, and it does enable us to, to reach out to white communities beyond the university. Um, and, and in terms of being inclus uh, inclusive, um, one of the things that we're very much trying to do wherever possible is to ensure that these events are hybrid or have potential for people to join or to, to view recordings afterwards. Um, and we were we were staggered to see that uh, one of these events um, as part of the festivals had over 67,000 views. Um, uh, and it, it just showed us actually that what might seem like a small event to us uh, had a, a, far, a reach far beyond our expectations. So working with, in partnership with groups has been um, key to, uh, I think, uh, the success of, of some of the events we've had um, and certainly it'd be a really rich experience for us. Um, just three quick examples. Lancaster Black History Group um, it is a grassroots group based in Lancaster that work, has worked with um, schools and colleges and, and with the university over the last couple of years to understand um, uh, the context of, 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 um, of Lancaster's, um, uh, I guess, historic role in, in transatlantic slavery. And, and through that, to um, provide educational experiences and opportunities for all of us to learn uh, uh, about how um, uh, how Black history impacts us still today, um, uh, and how how we learn uh, from those past experiences. Uh, and th this work with this group has been fantastic in terms of uh, opportunities for students on campus, but also bringing new people into the library. Uh, so we ho hosted a conference with the group. Um, they used our special collections to undertake some of the research that underpinned the project work. Um, it was a, a really good opportunity to understand how the library could intersect with, with work around EDI uh, at all stages uh, throughout a, a piece of work. Um, a second, uh, more recent example from earlier uh, this term uh, was some work we've done, done as part of our cybersecurity outreach. Um, uh, and this involved um, using our library spaces to host an event for uh, around 70 year nine school girls um, from, from six schools across um, the region, uh, using some of the kit that we have in our digital studio to, um, to in a really fun hands-on set of activities to explore areas like virtual reality, robotics, et cetera. Um, uh, and this is um, the first of several that we're planning for uh, the coming year as part of a partnership with the School of Computing and Communication. So um, a third example, um, one that is, is very much um, uh, more immediate in that there was an event just earlier this week, is the work we've been doing with the uh, with the city refugee and asylum seeker community groups. Um, it, it's, it's, again, a, a real eye opener for us uh, in terms of understanding not only the, the, um, the challenges that our refugee and asylum seeker communities face, but that these groups face in, in terms of uh, very little funding to support the fantastic work that they do. So some of the things that we are working with them on um, we, we introduced a community card last year that allowed, provides free access to the library uh, for, uh, for anyone that wishes to join, any uh, member outside of the university who wishes to join. Uh, but, but of course, the challenge for this particular group is just getting to the, to the university, which is um, three and a half miles south of the city. Um, so just working out uh, challenges around um, transport, uh, but also, what can we offer them uh, in particular as a group? And so we're working with this, this group of people to develop community collections uh, and as part of the outreach work that we do, um, partnering up with the University of Cumbria to see how we can support um, both access to the university and the library, but also what uh, ways of working within and with these communities. So uh, I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to run th quickly through a couple of slides now, um, just to say exhibitions. Um, uh, we've been more creative in our 
uh, approach to exhibitions since we opened this space. Here's just an example where our university cleaning staff were creating works to show as part of an exhibition that surfaces the, the fantastic work they, they've always done for us, but in particular, the, the often hidden work they did throughout the period of the pandemic. And this is showcased now within the, the library um, as part of an exhibition and now a permanent display. Exhibitions that have uh, involved partnering with researchers uh, have um, brought new dimensions to, to, to spaces in the library. So you can see the stairwell area in the entrance where the Marketplace and I exhibition that explored the perceptions of disability and the experiences of, of disabled people um, in, the, uh, in the commercial sector. And um, uh, listening with your ear to the wall um, exhibition that is an audio uh, exhibition that showcases um, isolation often as a result of uh, long term illness. And um, uh, th these exhibitions, uh, we've had, I think, seven or eight this term. Uh, so it's really become a, a key focus for us. Just a, a, a couple of final slides. Um, I haven't mentioned much about research. Um, of course, open research and open resources is very much part of our EDI agenda, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention our digital collections platform. And there has been some value that the library space has provided for that by um, uh, enabling us to showcase exhibitions um, uh, that, that take the, the that bring the, the research outputs from these collections to life in a, in a new and exciting way. So um, the, the work that we've done in the building has been a real opportunity for our staff to be involved uh, and uh, has been, as I've said a couple of times, a real learning opportunity for us. And it does feel very much like we're learning and developing together. Uh, and the, the connections that the space has provided uh, or the opportunities the space has provided to connect with new groups have really benefited us. Uh, uh, and has been the basis for the majority of our staff development activity over the past couple of years. Um, but it's also benefited our students, and I've not said too much about students, but they are absolutely at the centre of, of this. So whether it's through events that we, we've offered, um, like the, the, the Mending Station event where students came to learn basic mending skills, or performance by students as part, as part of our festival and induction events, or working in partnership with them in our supported learning area and creating resources. The students have been right at the center of, of this activity and I could talk for another 20 minutes about uh, what it is that they've provided. Um, just today, uh, as I sit in the building downstairs, we had a, a student society at the entrance talking about Entrepreneurship and uh, and um, uh, and uh, act activity uh, in the local um, community. Uh, we have an exhibition around um, provided uh, as part of our Disability History um, uh, Month uh, celebrations and recognition uh, in the foyer. It's of course it's it's World AIDS Day and and there's a talk this evening in our exhibition and event space. Um, uh, that students are, are leading on. And I'll shortly be joining an event where our, uh, a bunch of student reps will be working with us as we all look at areas around academic integrity and um, uh, developing support for students in that domain, um, uh, very much working in partnership with them there. So that's been a whirlwind, and I think I've possibly just exceeded my time. So I'm going to come to a close there. Uh, and thank you for your time. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll just stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much, Phil. That was a really inspiring uh, uh, presentation. Lots of lots of things to things for us to think about. And no doubt you will see plenty of questions on that uh, when we move into our discussion session. Um, but for now, we're going to move on to our, our third and uh, final presentation. Uh, and this is from um, Oliver Ierson. Uh, from the University of Birmingham. Um, Oliver has worked at the University of Birmingham for over 15 years, uh, fulfilling various roles related to teaching and learning space design and support. 
His current role is as Head of Learning Space Development based within library services, and that involves managing the ongoing development of centrally managed teaching and study spaces across campus. So Oliver is going to talk to us today um, um, about um, the new main library building. He's going to give us an accessibility focused tour of that space. And then he'll move on to discuss how the principles of inclusion uh, apply to various other student facing spaces across campus. So over to you, Oliver. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. Yeah, so a little caveat while I'm getting set up. Um, I was only informed that I was presenting at this a couple of days ago. So this is a thrown together um, tour for you, whistle stop tour, um, which may well not run to the full 20 minutes, but that's fine because we've run over a bit and there are plenty of questions uh, for when I've finished as well. So hopefully this will work out nicely. Um, so yeah, as Katie mentioned, I'm the head of learning space development. Um, you may notice that there's no mention of library in that job title. Uh, that's because until, a few years ago, I wasn't part of the library at all, and I did just focus on the management of teaching spaces and study spaces on campus. Um, but due to various quirks of the sort of university bureaucracy, our department was merged with library services a few years ago. Um, but actually, in that time, we've realised how many synergies there are between those two things. Um, and that sort of um, broad picture of study spaces across the campus is something that I'm going to come back to towards the end of the presentation. Um, so just to start off, I mean, we're talking about accessibility within the library building. Um, accessibility, I think, is almost coming, becoming a sort of outmoded term. And I think inclusion, inclusivity is probably a, a better term for what we're talking about. Um, but what do we mean by accessibility? Because it's traditionally thought of as provisions made to benefit the physically disabled. Um, but increasingly, that definition is being expanded to mean a service that meets the needs of all users, irrespective of their personal circumstances, I think. Um, and that's embodied quite nicely by this little quote that I handily pulled from our very own university website. Whoever wrote this has done a grand job. But uh, so that's as a university, we are striving to make the campus as accessible as possible for all users. In practice, this means removing existing barriers and designing out potential barriers that might prevent students, staff and visitors having fair and equal access to learning resources, buildings and equipment. I think that's a really nice way of putting it because there's no ambiguity there. There's no specific sort of um, concessions made to whatever group it is. Um, it's just saying it needs to be as accessible as it possibly can be for everybody who's going to be using it. Um, and as a building, the university, the, Main library um, is a great place to sort of look at all those features that can are sort of being be, um, put in place for accessibility. Um, the main library was built, well, it, fin it was opened in 2016, uh, took about three years to build, I think. So it's a relatively new building. Um, and it's very much at the heart of the university experience. I mean, as um, Phil mentioned, the, the, the library is at the heart of the university, as literally is, and um, that picture there you can see what we call the green heart, which is a green space right in the centre of campus, and the library overlooks that. Um, and it's a place where all students are going to spend some time at some point during their university journey, and so it really embodies that sort of idea of inclusivity. Um, so yeah, I'm going to give you a little tour of the main library, sort of focusing on aspects of it which are specifically catering for accessibility issues. Um, and then I'm going to broaden it out and look at some other spaces around campus, which sort of pick up on some of those uh, features as well. Um, so we can see that because it's such a new building, a lot of the accessible features uh, were kind of designed into the building from the outset. So there's certain parts of the building makeup which were you know, designed to be more inclusive, much more so than older buildings on campus. We're, we've got a real sort of mixture of um, different styles of architecture from different periods on, on this campus, from the central sort of uh, university buildings, which were built at the sort of end of the 19th and start of the 20th century, through to a, a large portion which were built in the 60s. Um, and when you compare though, particularly those 60s buildings to the more modern buildings, you can really see a, a massive gulf in the, the way that accessibility was treated. Um, some of those older buildings are full of very narrow corridors, narrow doors, tiny lifts, really difficult to find your way around, particularly if you, you're physically um, disabled. So a couple of um, sort of features here we have 
um, fully automated front doors. That's the main front doors of the library building. Um, nice wide doors, nice wide spaces when you get inside. Um, really nice big lifts with um, braille on the panels. Um, there's four of these lifts. They all feature um, verbal announcements on either, all floors for people who may be visually impaired. Um, there's also visual fire alarms, um, alerts for hearing impaired. That's throughout the building. Um, we have things such as power assisted height adjustable desks throughout the study spaces. Um, that's something sort of put in a standard and a, and, a, and a put everywhere. There's not just sort of areas where there's accessible desks, you know, they're included wherever possible within the sort of standard furniture. And as I'll come on to a bit later, um, we're able to sort of reconfigure those spaces and move those uh, height adjustable desks around quite easily because of the design of the building. Uh, here we've got um, a dedicated space for students who might require specialist software and hardware. Um, so that's a, bo a bookable space, which anybody needs to use those services can book via the front desk. Uh, and similar to that, we have quite a few of these um, bookable private study spaces. Um, maybe that students have issues with studying in open spaces, they may have special requirements which may require a more a private space. So that's got a standalone booking system. As you can see on the door, there's a little lock on there and you have to have it booked before you can actually use the space. Uh, we have various fully accessible changing areas. As you can see, again, this is something that's, because it was designed into the building from the very outset, it's really, sort of top quality example of this kind of feature you've got a really big nice uh, large accessible space for um disabled changing etc we've actually got a hoist mechanism here for this uh table um and that sort of is combined with uh toilet facilities and shower facilities throughout the building um, all follow that sort of lead they're all um gender neutral with toilet facilities in the, in the building um and there's various sort of disabled toilet features on each floor of the building as well So as I mentioned, one of the key things that we sort of took into consideration when designing the library was future-proofing it. So not only making it tick all the boxes accessibility-wise for how we see that now, but also looking forward to how are things going to change um, and recognising that we don't know what those changes will be, but making it as easy as possible in the future to adapt the space um, to, to make it better as, as things change in the future. So... As you can see from this slide and the next one, we've got the library study areas are very large open plan spaces, minimal structural walls, um, and that allows us to split up the spaces in different ways as we see fit. Um, this space actually has changed quite a lot uh, since COVID. Beforehand, we had a lot more of these um, sofas with sort of high backs all along this area. Um, but student feedback has sort of told us that that's less what they're into uh, in terms of a study, library study space. They're more concerned with having enough spaces to cater for everybody who wants to use the library, uh, which is why we've brought in sort of more of these individual study desks. Um, and you can see here, this is another room adjacent to that one. Again, big open plan space. Uh, we can create divisions within the space using the furniture and using these little portable um, screens. Um, but what this also illustrates, uh, this exciting photo on the left, which is a floor grommet. Uh, the humble floor grommet, it may not look much, but actually the, the whole floor is a sort of floating floor mechanism with power bars that run underneath it all the way through the building, which means that pretty much anywhere you can stick one of these grommets is pretty easy to do. You just cut a hole in the, ceiling, the uh, floor tile and you can add a power socket pretty much anywhere you want, which means that the whole lot of the space of these study spaces is really um, reconfigurable. So this space in particular, I mean, has actually recently included um, a temporary office set up over COVID for one of the international student teams, which we set up in uh, the far corner of the room. Um, we were able to do that again because we could put a load of extra power in power and network facilities for them. Um, just the right of where I took this photo at the moment is a shop front for the university in-house printing team. Um, and again, they've just put up some temporary partitions around the area that they're using and have turned that into a fully functional sort of shop area where people can come and pick up their dissertations, get things printed, etc. And so it's a really good example of how these spaces can be changed around to sort of meet the evolving needs of the student community. 
So moving on from things that were designed into the building, uh, I've got a few examples of things that have changed since the building was open and in response to some of those emerging um, situations. Um, cost of living is a big topic at the moment. And so we've made various sort of changes to help students who may be struggling in that respect. So we've got um, long and short term laptop loans uh, for people who may not be able to afford the technology they need for their course. Uh, we have microwave and hot water facilities for people to so it's more affordable for people to bring their own food in while they're studying and um, that's something which as again i'll mention later on that we're sort of expanding into other spaces not just the library um very similar to actually uh what the previous presentation we've started a dedicated well-being zone um which is just a space for students to sort of take some time out of, of study and just relax a bit so obviously we've got more soft furnishings got plants it's a nice relaxed area a bit away from the sort of hubbub of the, of the main library spaces um, and we have invested in a sort of large collection of um, well-being sort of focused texts and that ranges from mental health awareness sort of stuff through to cookbooks that sort of thing uh, so a really nice collection which we've added um, we've also done things such as um, avoiding student fines wherever possible. We used to have a policy, of, obviously, like a, many libraries do, of fining people for late returns, but that's sort of been pushed right back so we can avoid fining people wherever possible. Um, we also offer free interlibrary loans and free scanning facilities, that sort of thing, and sort of recognition that um, students may not have quite as much disposable income as they may have done in the past. Yeah, so as I mentioned at the start, I mean, there's a crossover, particularly within my role between various different university spaces, but I think that students probably don't recognise the differences between spaces as much as the people who run those, so those spaces do. So here we've got sort of an example of library space on the left, some um, non-library study space, and then also teaching space. Um, again, I mean, students won't recognize the difference between library study space and other study space they'd expect it to be it's university study space to them and they'd expect to see the same sort of facilities uh, in both of those types of spaces same with teaching space and actually we actively encourage students to use take the teaching space as study space when the rooms aren't booked for teaching um as standard now all of our teaching spaces have a digital screen um just by the door which shows the timetable for that day so that any sort of one or two hour slots where the room isn't used for teaching we encourage students to go in and use it as an extra study space um so the sort of principles for accessibility that i've mentioned in terms of the library also apply to all these other spaces um, just to sort of make an inclusive campus rather than just standalone inclusive buildings. Um, I'll just give you a few examples of those sorts of spaces and what we kind of do to cater for it. So this is actually a relatively recently adapted space in the main Aston Webb building, which is the big red brick building uh, at the heart of the University of Birmingham, which you may well be familiar with. Uh, they seem to use it on most news reports uh, about universities in general. Aston Webb shows up in the background somewhere. Um, so this is on the lower ground floor level. Uh, it used to just be offices, but it's been opened out. And as you can see, it's a similar principle to uh, the library spaces. And they've taken out as many of those sort of internal walls as they can to make it open um, and accessible as possible. And we try and provide a, a, a range of different spaces because we're in recognition of the fact that people all study in different ways they all have different requirements for study space um so on the right you can see this is actually a sort of private area just at the back of this main room um, which is a silent study space we also have a small computer room here um, there's a more relaxed area just over here with sofas and then a sort of group work area on the left here Another really good example of this sort of broad range of spaces is uh, this is a, a room called the Mason Lounge in the Arts Building. Um, the, the idea behind this was to sort of create a home from home for students. And that's really something that is, again, something to think about in terms of accessibility is that a lot of students may have um, needs and requirements which they don't necessarily disclose to uh, the university it might not be something that they think is that serious but may affect how they study or what they're able to do in terms of coming to campus and study um, so for example I mean students may not have the greatest home setup and may not have an appropriate place at home to study or even to just relax and, and you know 
take take half an hour to themselves. So this part of this space is um, sort of made up to look like a living room. Um, it's a more social sort of space. Obviously, the sort of kitchen dining room sort of style table there for actual studying, but sofas and sort of coffee tables as well. There's actually a cafe area at the back here. Um, at the back of the room, you've got more of a sort of style and study space with, with computers. Uh, and then next to the cafe, you've got a more sort of kitchen dining kind of area, which has more of a cafe kind of vibe. All those sorts of things. So as I say, a recognition that people all study in different ways and that you may not know what limitations uh, and sort of circumstances people are in. And so you've just got to do your best to kind of design a space that ticks as many boxes as you possibly can for as many different people. And um, moving on to teaching rooms, as I said, I mean, the, the bulk of my job is actually uh, the sort of major refurbishment of teaching rooms across campus. Um, and so there's various things that, which we now fit as standard to those teaching rooms. So on the left, we have a height adjustable lectern. Um, so it's not just students, obviously, that we're talking about in terms of accessibility. There's lecturers who may also benefit from that. So um, height adjustable lectern to, to make it usable by most people possible and just as in the library height adjustable desks are now fitted as standard in all teaching rooms um particularly in flat floored rooms we try and put those not at the front not at the back that's generally where accessible furniture tends to get shoved um so people in, with accessibility issues always find themselves in the same spots so we try and mix that up a bit and again because of the uh ease with which we can reconfigure these spaces that can actually be put in different places depending on um, the needs of the users. Uh, another one that um, I wasn't aware of until I started designing classrooms but having a high contrast teaching wall um, so rather than having a white wall with white whiteboards on it and white projection screens, which can potentially make it really hard for people with uh, visual impairments to see what's happening. If you put a darker colour um, on, the, on the teaching wall, it really improves that for a lot of people who have those issues. Um, so that, again, is something we do as standard now. Um, and like a lot of these changes, it actually benefits everyone. Um, you know, it just makes it a more attractive space. It looks like more thought has gone into it. That we care about the, the environment that students are in. And nothing wrong with adding a splash of colour to an otherwise fairly uh, drab business-like space. Um, and I'm just going to finish off with another word about sort of reconfiguration and future-proofing. This is quite an interesting example because this space, um, I don't actually have a picture of the first iteration of it, but it, it, in its previous life, and I'm sure there's been various things before that, but this was actually the furniture showroom for our furniture supplier. Um, they use this to sort of have an example of all their bits and bobs of furniture that they could potentially show us um, at the university. Um, that was until the sort of beginning of 2020. Um, during the pandemic, we had a real shortage of teaching spaces due to various factors, um, social distancing, various other spaces being used for other things. And so we needed to create a lot of teach, extra teaching spaces at really short notice. So the picture on the left is how it spent the last couple of years as a, an ad hoc teaching space. Um, and then within the last couple of weeks, I've actually just been involved in reconfiguring this space as a study space because, again, study spaces are in massive demand at the moment. Um, and so we were able to just move all that furniture out, repurpose that elsewhere on campus, and we've uh, fitted it out with more sort of uh, designated study spaces. Um, it's just a really good example of how we don't really know how spaces are going to be used in future. And so when we're building new, new buildings, it's great to keep that in mind just so that you can you've got that freedom somewhere along the line of, of making it work better. Um, I think that's all I've got to say at the moment. I'm going to, I've got my contact details, but also my manager's contact details. He's more library focused than I am. And so if you have any library specific queries, um, I'm sure he'd be delighted to answer. But if you have any more general queries about anything I've spoken about today, please feel free to get in touch or ask via the Q&A, uh, which we're to tackle now, I believe. Switch my microphone on. Oliver, thank you so much for that session. Uh, thank you to all of our speakers this afternoon. I think it's wonderful to see the innovation that's going on across the sector, the responsiveness that there is in research libraries and academic libraries across the country to the changing needs of our users, of our students, academic staff, 
uh, reaching out to the communities that we're part of as well. I think it's been really nice to see such diverse examples of the ways in which people are actually tackling that uh, in different locations across the UK at the moment. Oliver, would you like to pop your camera back on for a moment? Because I'm probably going to pick up with you, first of all, if that's OK, on a, a couple of questions that have actually come in around this. One of the themes that's uh, coming through for a couple of our sessions is around noise levels. Mm. Still, it can be quite a challenging issue for us still in, in libraries, the expectations around noise. And someone has asked if, uh, Patricia has asked if there are were, were any issues around that in, uh, in you know, the way you've designed the spaces and managing noise levels in those open areas? Yeah, sure, that's uh, definitely something that was taken into consideration. Um, the way that we've tackled it it's in the main library building, certainly, is that um, it was designed so that the noise levels decrease as you go further up the building. Um, so there was a recognition the ground floor where everybody's in, coming in and out is just going to be noisier because there's people doing things at the front desk. You need to be able to speak. And, and so the, the sort of way we furnished it reflected that expectation. And that's why we had a lot of the more social furniture. We had sort of the uh, booths and sofas and stuff originally down there and more of the group study kind of work zones. Um, and again, as you move up the building, um, the, the furniture kind of dictates what we expect people to, or how we expect people to behave in those spaces. The third floor particularly is a, a pretty much a silent study space. We do have a few, a few banners that say quiet study up there. Um, but it just, it, students so far seem to respect that and that they kind of understand that that's, that's how it's gonna work. Um, Similarly, in the Mason Lounge, actually, which is one of the last of the slides that I showed you with the sort of different zones, it's a similar principle, even though that's all on one uh, level. Um, it gets quieter as you move away from those front doors. So you've got the cafe section at the front where next to the main doors, um, the sort of living room section, which is semi-partitioned off with bookshelves, and then a qu quiet st study area at the back. So again, it's the, it's the kind of furniture and the semi-permanent partitions which dictate that kind of behaviour and hopefully manage the noise. Interesting. Um David and Kirsty, I'm going to come to you on noise as well at this point, because uh, perhaps not surprisingly, a lot of people asking um, how you deal with noise, whether the room that you've created, the family room that you've created is soundproofed. Um, I think those might be parents who are asking that question somehow. Um, uh, and just how you deal with, with that issue in that area. Yeah, it's a very good question. The room isn't soundproofed. Um, so that was part of uh thought process when we were deciding which room to use and uh, we had a few considerations which really drove that that decision making it needed to be a room which was relatively close to the help desk and uh, our reception point so that users weren't too far from support when and if they needed it it needed to be somewhere with level access we didn't want people to be going through the the building with push chairs unnecessarily that kind of thing so it needed to be close by and ideally it also needed to be somewhere exactly where it, it wouldn't have that kind of impact on on sound for other users. So slightly counterintuitively, it has ended up on the ground floor of what is otherwise a silent part of our building, um, but it doesn't adjoin any other areas that particularly are silent. Um, I also, we conducted a noise assessment. So we borrowed some equipment for our estates department to measure the noise bleed into other uh, adjoining areas. And we were satisfied that it wasn't um, too much of an issue. It's absolutely right. It's a space that will have children in it. Um, the line that I give when I'm doing the inductions for our students for children is that we understand a certain amount of noise is going to happen. It's never going to be a silent area, but that it is a, a study area. So that they need to be mindful, of course, of other students working in that space. Um, and if their child needs to go out for a little bit and come back in when they're able to, to be a bit quieter again, that's kind of what we ask them to do. So it's in some ways a self-policed space. We're asking students to be mindful of that and to moderate the use of the space accordingly. David, do you have limits on how many people are allowed in there at one time? We do. So uh, we have, um, as I mentioned, a booking policy at the moment. Students will need to book either ahead of time or when they arrive. And we've set that to be four students. So the capacity is driven by the adults in the space rather than the children. We don't have a set limit of children in the space, but we've worked to an idea of it's likely that a, a student wouldn't bring more than two children with them because let's face it you're not going to get a lot of studying done if you 
tried to do that, but that's not a hard and fast rule. Obviously, you may just bring one child, you may bring more. So it's the the adult capacity that's driven that. Um, and really, uh, we have no basis for that other than what we thought would be workable because we have no measure really for how the space would be used. We felt that four was a sensible um, amount of spaces for the size of the room that we have. Interesting. And it is purely for the use of students, is it? We've had a couple of questions as to whether staff were allowed to use that as well. It is. And this decision is largely driven by a, a policy at the university around staff bringing children to the workplace, which is that they're not allowed to. Um, that is quite an old policy. It predates the pandemic and, of course, predates all of the changes to university policies around remote working, hybrid working. So it's something that we would like to take up with, with the wider university to see if that um, policy needs to be updated. But at the moment, we have said it is only for um, students with children to use the space rather than staff or, or for externals as well. Where we're really seeing queries about that is from students who have members of staff as partners at the university or more outside. Um, so they're asking, well, could it, would it be possible for us all to come and use the space together? So that's the particular use case that we, we would like to look at. We have also had queries, for example, around would it be okay to use that um, space for a supervision meeting? So for a, a research postgraduate who wanted to meet their supervisor somewhere but had to have their child with them. So we're, we're looking at the feasibility of those specific instances. There is a little bit of a tension, of course, if we open the space up to staff, it may well be that it's always used by staff. And then the students who were the primary driver for that space wouldn't be able to book a seat to use it. So there is an issue there around the, um, the sort of openness of, of the space, I think. Interesting. Thank you, David. Phil, I'm going to come on to you with a, a related question to this, I suppose, which came through around academic staff using your library for teaching as well. Is that something that is allowed and permitted? Or again, are you principally a, a student facing service? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a really interesting question because there, there is a, a lot of pressure on campus for teaching space um, uh, and, and also meeting space as well. And, uh, and uh, we have had conversations with people around where collaboration and meetings meet um, uh, and, and what, what the difference is there. Uh, we, we do want the, the space to be well used, um, but be, to be purposefully used as well. Um, so uh, the short answer is no, we don't allow teaching, um, but there's a small but in there. Um, uh, so for example, when that teaching is in partnership with, with library staff, uh, when it's using some of our, uh, for example, my, maybe using some of our special collections or, or, or um, other library resources that make it worthwhile using those spaces, then we would um, uh, make an exception. What we've done is to introduce a, a sort of booking form where we ask two key questions. How does the event that you, you're proposing um, support our library vision? Um, um, uh, does it, how does it align with what the, we see as the purpose of the library? And secondly, how we partner with the library. We don't want to just be offering space. We want to understand you know, what role we might play alongside others in, in relation to the events we hold. Um, so, so that's what we're using at the minute to try and manage um, expectations for using the space. Yeah, interesting. Some challenges, I think, always really for us around those slightly blurry areas, aren't there, in terms of space being used as well. It was interesting to see a comment from one of our colleagues in India in the chat saying that they actually quite often struggle to find spaces within their library because of the demands they're, they're actually getting. Is that something, do you find that you have capacity for most of your students? Are there times when you're operating very close to that full capacity, Phil? Um, uh, I, I guess we've it, it's always been a busy library and um, we increased our uh, study um, individual study space by probably around a third uh, with the most recent extension. Um, I, there are points in the term where the building can feel fairly full. Um, we do have a account, although we don't have gates um, for our library, we do have a um, a camera that counts bodies in and out 
um, so that we get real time uh, numbers on the number of people in the building at any one time. And it never exceeds the capacity, uh, official capacity of the building, but it does get uh, well up into the sort of 80, 85 percent mark for that. Um, uh, the stocks on the spaces that we've created, um, we, we created them as, as flexible uh, spaces so that we do have some capacity to uh, to rearrange space if we need to to increase the amount of study space. I was particularly struck by you know your session and also Oliver the the the, the emphasis on flexibility in spaces now. I think it's a key thing, isn't it, for uh, for libraries moving forward to have that capacity to actually adapt to the changing demands that we're actually seeing from users. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, we were building this latest extension uh, during the pandemic um, when suddenly the, the demands on the library and the use of it completely changed. We opened it um, when, when we weren't all fully back on campus. And so you really can't anticipate how the building might be used at any point in time uh, from month to month in a year, but and certainly not from year to year. So I think uh, flexibility is, is essential in that respect. David, can I come back to you or uh, to Kirsty either um, on the question of space still and where did the space actually come from for the family room? Did you have to actually give something up in order to provide that space? Oh, David, on you go. OK, thanks, Kirsty. Um, yes and no. Um, so as I mentioned, we, we had a choice to make about which space we would use, and that was somewhat limited actually in terms of the the choices that were available to fit the criteria that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the space that we we landed on was formerly a postgraduate only study room and um, so the question I think asked oh, did it have an impact on shelf space not on shelf space but to an extent on on study space. What we decided to do was to move that study space and um, so we earmarked a a room elsewhere in the library that had up to that point been a socially distanced study space. Uh, we had two of those. We decided as part of our measures um, coming out of, of our sort of COVID um, changes that we didn't need two. So we decided to keep one of those spaces for social distance study space and to turn the other one into a new postgraduate space. Um, so we, we consulted with users. There wasn't a huge amount of, of controversy about that. I think they were happy to have a new space, and if anything, the new space perhaps is better. It's got a nicer view over campus. Um, it has a, a closer proximity to the book stock, so it's it's quite a, a good space still for our, our postgraduate students. So we've retained the space that's specific for them, but we're able to turn the, the family study room into a, that, that new space as well. I suppose yeah, what we lost slightly was that kind of more general study space that's open to everyone. Um, and so it's around about making those choices as always. Thank you both. And um, a question again from one of my colleagues at Southampton, something that's very uh, high on our agenda at the moment. Your pictures looked beautifully clean and pristine. How, how do you manage to keep the space clean? <laughs> do you manage to keep the space clean? <laughs> yes, all we'll taken before it opens to users. So that's lovely <laughs> pristine images there. Um, at the moment, it's not been a huge challenge, but of course we it's it's not been open very long. We've seen modest usage to date, so there's not been a huge amount of, of challenge with that. Um, I think it will be over time that we see that that cleanliness being tested a little bit more. It's part of what we do in the inductions with the students. So we do set an expectation that they will be keeping the room as clean and tidy as possible. Clearly, that's not always going to happen, but we do try to set that expectation for them. Um, we provide as, as regular a clean of that space as possible, although obviously there are challenges there with the capacity of the cleaning and facility staff from the university. And we're also undertaking to do a deep clean of the space on a regular basis, but that will require an external company. So uh, one of my colleagues who's on the call um, is undertaking to um, arrange a contract for that. But that, of course, is an added cost and added um, admin um, burden on, on the space. So at the moment, we've not really seen any problems, but I think we've yet to test it fully in, in that regard. Really lovely, Phil, to see your recognition of the importance of cleaners in spaces. It's probably something we don't talk about very much, but actually just the, the people, the teams that actually underpin our ability to manage these spaces sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, we, we're 
uh, open 24 seven during term time um, uh, and have long opening hours in, in the holiday periods as well. Um, so, so some of our staff uh, have regular contact uh, with, with cleaning staff, but for the majority of staff and for uh, a large proportion of our users, um, uh, they are the, the, the hidden work, workforce that absolutely creates a, or maintains a fantastic building in, in, in the condition that, that everyone enjoys. Um, but they're, they're also that point of contact for people when often the, um, uh, the, the, the library can be fairly quiet as well. So they provide real sort of personal sort of point of contact there that I, I know is really welcomed. Um, so, it's, so it's really nice to have that. I think there were 80 um, clean staff that, that turned up for this workshop event. Unfortunately, not all 80 could be involved, but they all felt that it, it, it helped to uh, make them much more visible and it was, it was really appreciated. Um, really, I think a really nice, uh, really nice idea behind that. We're coming up towards time, I can see. We've had, uh, and thank you to everyone for the, the num numerous questions that we've had. I'm going to pick up on one that's just come up in the chat, actually, addressed to all of you. And it's really around involving students in that, whether you've actually made any changes to your original plan or your vision for the spaces in response to student feedback once those spaces have been open. Is there anyone who wants to pick up for that? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd like to jump in for that. Yeah. I mean, I, I kind of touched on it during the presentation, but um, originally there were, we had a lot more of the kind of soft furnishing kind of um, areas in, in the main library. Um, and sort of to answer another question previously as well, our, our demand for this library is huge. Um, we regularly get close to capacity. Um, and it's actually bigger than the previous main library was, but we often get feedback that says, why have you made it smaller? Why have you reduced the space? We haven't reduced the spaces. We've added more, but I think because it's such a popular building, it's regularly full now. And so, I mean, um, there's massive demand on all study spaces across campus. Um, and yeah, so as, as part of that feedback, we have increased the number of individual study spaces and moved out some of those more social areas, which feedback has said they're just not interested. Particularly in the library, I think those spaces are important in other study, study spaces, but there's a certain expectation for a library to be a certain way. And so, yeah, we certainly have changed things. Yeah, 